You're listening to The Recovered Life Show, the show that helps people in recovery live their best recovered lives. And here is your host, Damon Frank. And welcome back to The Recovered Life Show. It is Wednesday, July 6, 2022. How was your fourth, Christina Dennis? Oh, it was wonderful, Damon Frank. How was yours? You know, it was really well. I'm, you know, we, I saw some people that I hadn't seen mm-hmm. for a while, spent some time with family. That is always fun, especially, you know, with this pandemic, which we talked about before, we're trying to kind of get back into the groove of things. Exactly. And I know I'm still not really going to regular 12 step group meetings. Everything's no. still pretty much online here in LA. Um, it so it was really good to connect with people and see people that I hadn't seen for a while. I had a ball. My my neighborhood's kind of one of those old-fashioned neighborhoods with the parade, you know, at three o'clock where every kid gets on their bike. And then um, there's kind of a, a little bit of a, you know, uh, sharks and jets type of situation with my neighbors and who can shoot off the most. And uh, the next day, it just looks like a war zone. So everything is cleaned up now. It's Wednesday. Doesn't smell like, you know, smoke everywhere and we're all back to summer i love that you know i remember as a kid rummaging through all the old fireworks we Mm -hmm. usually hose them down you know to be safe but the ones that were left over trying to light that last little sparkler uh, oh my goodness two after come on we were up to all that kind of stuff kids of the 80s that's the way it is all the little pyro i wasn't exactly all you weren't, you didn't, you mm-hmm. didn't do it. You were afraid of them. I know a lot of I was people afraid of my them. My sister, my sister was afraid of them. She was like, now I'm afraid. I am still afraid. I am still afraid. Yes, absolutely. They're jarring. And I have a little puppy who gets scared too. So yes, that I is, that to... is, a, that is a downside of it, man. Yeah. I'm so glad to be back though on Wednesday here after the four talking about your recovery. You know, I love mm-hmm. to do the show with you because we always tap into things that we're talking about in our coaching practice and in yes. our own lives, honestly, because that's what this is all about living our best recovered life. It is. But before we jump into the topic, I want to tell everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please keep like, share, follow, and leaving us comments so we can bring content that you're interested in and also join our community. It's completely free recoveredlife.us. We have wonderful, wonderful, exclusive content that's over there. We use the Volley app. So you actually get to meet people all over the world. You can connect with both Damon and I, there's a beautiful daily drink conversation conversation that's going on and it just helps us all live our best recovered life. So I hope to see you over there. It's called recoveredlife.us. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? One of the great things about becoming a member is you do get exclusive access to mm-hmm. our Volley app as well as emailed a lot of exclusive content that you and I do. But I couldn't believe how many people I actually interacted with over the 4th of July over right. the week, really, with people that just, you know, hey, are they trying to get sober? They're new to sobriety or they've been sober for decades and just want to check in. Right. And Volley is so great with that because being in this volley community and in the recovered life community, it's that one-on-one that we're able to do, but we're also able to do the group too as well. So I love it. So welcome. If you are new to volley, please reach out and say hello to Christina and myself. If you are on the app. So Christina, here we go. We're talking about something that you and I have never suffered from in our Mm -hmm. whole recovery, but we thought that we just mentioned this just to be nice to people who might. That's workaholism in sobriety. <laughs> workaholism. This, this is the perfect time to do this topic too, because if you are anything like I was, having summer vacation, having downtimes that we were supposed to learn how to enjoy, or you know, we anticipated that ah, that's exactly what I want to do. I can't wait to relax. I can't wait to not go to work, and then being incredibly uncomfortable when I was on vacation is something that I had to address. And I I really did have to see how much my dopamine seeking ways were costing me. And there's always this discussion about the elusive balance of life. So I can't wait to hear what you have to say um, and, and how you have obtained balance. Well, this is it. I, I love this topic because it's something that I never wanted to talk about probably <laughs> for the first two decades of my recovery, right? right? I think a lot of people suffer from workaholism in sobriety. Um, I know you and I aren't the only ones that have suffered from it. Right. Um, you know, it's interesting because it's a tricky thing. 
On one side, I think when you first get sober, there's this realization with people. And, you know, you and I go through this as coaches, you know, having clients that say, oh, my God, I've lost so much time. Yes. I have to catch up. Maybe there's a financial issue where they have to work more. They have two to three jobs, right? We're not exactly. talking about that. We're, we're, ta mm -hmm. we're not talking about for need. We're talking about using work in order to kind of escape from what you should be doing in your life. So, so true. And, and yes, I'm, I'm glad that you clarified that because there certainly have been times in my life where, <clears throat> and even in longer term sobriety, where the, the situation called for me, <clears throat> excuse me, called for me to put some extra hours in and to put some, you know, focus on a certain area, you know, opening businesses, having a certain project that you want to set off. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you my, when I first got into sobriety, it would have been so easy. Uh, and, and dare I say is exactly what I did where I started focusing on career <clears throat> and avoiding all the things that yeah. scared me in life. Yeah, I think that's the I think the thing is too is that a lot of people in recovery and I'm going to say that this is something that a lot of my recovery I had a problem with. I had a problem relaxing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't somebody who took vacations. I don't <clears throat> like to. I like to do what I like to do, right? I yeah. like working, you know, I'm an entrepreneur uh, mm -hmm. as well as being in the recovery business. Um and I like it. I enjoy yes. it. I have friends doing it. You know, you and I have, have got things that we do in recovery. We enjoy doing it, right? But there is a time where I remember where it might have been a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday or a late night. Mm -hmm. where I didn't really have to be there. But in order to in order to not be there and work, I would have to be present somewhere else. And right. it was uncomfortable. I had to maybe go make friends or deal with something in my personal life or whatever. And it was a way to escape Mm -hmm. into not having to deal with that. And it's a really valid excuse. It's like, look, I'm working hard yeah. for my family. I'm trying yes. to get things done. But at the end of the day, I really didn't probably need to do it. I did it be just because I had a compulsion to do it because I wasn't comfortable elsewhere. So, so good of you to, to say it that way too, because I think that it's, it's really easy to defend working a lot, right? It's, it's relished in our world. It's, it's an admirable, you know, quality that we're hard workers. And it says that, uh, I, I think it's in the 12 by 12 where alcoholics can do the work of five men, you know, that we definitely have that dopamine uh, surges that dopamine seeking behavior. And isn't it better than drinking? You know, oh, okay, they work a lot. You know, it's kind of like the exercise gym rat that could be kind of ends up being in the gym versus, you know, drinking that yes, make the road wide in the beginning, make your recovery wide. We're not asking you to figure this out. But I think understanding that, um, okay, what I think is the most important thing that I I learned about myself was that I didn't have the skill set to relax. I didn't yes. have the skills, just like co codependence, we are afraid of intimacy. This is what was holding me back. And I had to actively learn how to relax and have faith and trust. Well, that is hard to admit. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I really had a hard time relaxing. Mm -hmm. I dreaded actually time off because I really didn't know what to do. Like yes. I would end up just reading things for work or trying to learn something or trying to achieve something. I will say now it's interesting. I was thinking about this when we were doing this episode, Christina, you know, because when you and I were talking about what we wanted to discuss this week on the Recovered Life Show, I thought, yeah, you know, I was expressing to you. It's like, you know what? I think for the first time in my life, I can actually sit down and watch a movie, sit down, read a book. I can actually do nothing and be right. okay with it. Not always. I'm still a very driven person. You know, I'm very driven, yes. but I've trained myself in recovery, especially I would say, you know, my third decade in recovery. I've trained myself that it's not healthy for me to be obsessive all the time about work and doing and achieving. Right. It's not it's not, it's not the right thing for me anymore. And it was hard to let go of. I mean, I'm telling you, it probably took me 10 years to let go of this. 
Sure. No, exactly. I remember, you know, we have different histories as far as work. I had, you know, a special needs son that absolutely had to put away some of the career aspirations that I had and, you know, lived with uh, my child who's nonverbal and just, you know, that was a big wake up call, not having the feedback. Work is kind of easy sometimes compared to our home life. I think most yeah. parents would say it's easier to work outside of the home than it is to work inside of the home and raising small children, it certainly feels a lot more controllable and you get that break, right? That you don't if you are a permanent caregiver. Add on top of that special needs, I went through an actual grieving period of not having the feedback that I would get out of work, those ego driven activities, those accolades. You know, my son wasn't cheering me for my great presentation at the playground. And so it came in phases for me. And after he, you know, started to be more independent and I decided to, you know, be a full time coach, then it was a much smaller group than than what I've dealt with. And now I actively, actively choose uh, serotonin building activities, rest in between. Like I, I realize on my day schedule, I have to schedule a certain way to have boundaries and I have to live through the uncomfortable part. And I will tell you, just like you said, it took you till the last 10 years. It took me that long to realize this is a learned skill that I don't have, wow. you know, and well, didn't you know, have. The thing, the thing is, is that I think one of the things that you learn, if you are a runner, in your mm -hmm. addiction. If mm -hmm. you're somebody who just like, okay, next relationship, next city, next job, I'm through with this, I'm moving on, right? If you're a runner, you mm -hmm. learn in recovery to no longer run, to stop yes. running, right? Yes. And also, you know, but one of the things is I think with work laws and that is, is interesting is, is that we can trick ourselves, our mind to say, well, we're doing a good thing. We're working, we're, you know, yes. being productive and everything. But really, a lot of the times, it's just this escape from dealing with something that we need to deal with, right? And right. I found one of the things that I needed to deal with is I didn't really know how to have fun yeah. in recovery. <laughs> I, I, I didn't because no. I felt like I had spent all my fun when I was out there. I'm like, right. dude, I punched the card. That credit card's been maxed and canceled. Yes, I can go to family things or do stuff, but I really can't go have fun. Yes. go hang out with people or do stuff like that's done with my life. And that was a huge mistake. And that was a determined, you know, that was a determination that I made because I really didn't know any better. Right. Right. I really right. didn't know any better that I really had to work on how to have fun and relax sober. Totally, totally true. And if you are saying, what are you talking about? You know, if you're a family member, because I work a lot with codependents and families, you're like, what are you talking about? All they do is drink or sit down. No, no, no. It's probably that idle time that causes us addicts to self-medicate. I know for me it was. And one of the exercises that I always start uh, new clients out with that you can easily take is a personal care contract. And what it is, is, is that you make a commitment that you're going to do something physically, emotionally, and mm -hmm. spiritually for yourself every day. And the emotional one, there's a caveat, needs to not have anything to do with production or contribution. And it is one of the hardest things for us to even wrap our heads around. Because if you are, and I do believe this, I've said it a hundred times, if you're an addict, you're a codependent, um, you don't know, I didn't know how to give myself anything or do something or even have pleasure unless it helped somebody else, unless it was, you know, for some kind of expectation of others. And I still struggle with this sometimes, but recovery continues to teach me that, okay, what do I think is fun? How do I get comfortable? How do I get comfortable with my nervous system sitting and not producing? And, you know, it's a little bit of separation from ego, uh, if I'm being honest. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I'm glad that you mentioned the codependency thing. And I glad, I'm glad that you mentioned techniques because a lot of people that might be listening to this or realize that like, hey, I have workaholism. I'm in recovery. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the deal. But I relate to what Damon and Christina are saying. When we come back after this really quick break, I want to get into 
how codependency plays a role in this because i know yes. you and i both have a little uh, opinion on this because i think uh -huh. it really does i think in the workspace it does. and then also i want to talk about some strategies that people can use right now to get out of that workaholic bind so we're going to get to all of that and more when we come right back after this quick break if you are newly sober trying to get sober or you've been sober for decades and are looking to take your sobriety to the next level, the Recovery Breakthrough six-week transformation concierge coaching program might be right for you. Have Damon Frank and Christina Dennis build a custom roadmap to get you on the path to getting what you really need. Receive hands-on concierge coaching and stay focused and productive with our daily check-ins. If you're ready to experience your recovery breakthrough and start the journey towards the transformation you deserve, book a free get to know you call today and find out what is possible in your recovery. To find out more about recovery breakthrough and to book your free call, go to recoveredlife.us. That's recoveredlife.us. You're listening to The Recovered Life Show. Okay, Christina, as promised, we're going to dive into this codependency, mm -hmm. workaholism. What's a tie-in here? Well, I mean, a codependent and a workaholic are afraid of having intimacy in their life, and they are afraid of living uh, in the here and now. And so the two of them have very much in common. Codependents will use workaholism as a way to continue their codependence and as a way to prove their worth. Codependents need outside opinions. They need outside feedback to have self-worth. And so one of the easiest ways to get that is to become a workaholic, right? Everybody loves Christina because she's always knocking it out of the park. Oh, is there a birthday party that needs to be planned? Ask Christy because she will take care of it. And you get that immediate feedback all the time, right? The problem with it, though, with workaholism and not having balance is that you aren't being who you are. So people don't really know who you are and you don't feel seen. And a lot of times we become martyrs and we become resentful and angry because we keep picking up all the pieces and it isn't fulfilling. So good. So good. You know, I'm glad that you mentioned that about picking up the pieces. One of the ways that codependency played out because mm -hmm. I didn't even realize I had codependent traits, honestly, sure, it came out in business because I noticed that I was picking people business partners and employees that would continually let me down yes. so I could come in and do the work and save the day. And yes. that would mean me working nights, weekends, missing things with my family and friends, not having friends, having mm -hmm. to just totally be committed to one, th right? And, and, and what I was getting out of that at the end of the day, as I realized was, is that I was getting that hit of, wow, I'm the person that always saves them. But I had to realize I was the one that was accepting that. And I was the one that was creating at the end of the day, this experience, although so, they were the ones that weren't living up to their expectations. I was the one that was making that bed possible. Right. And, and we hate this part of codependency. I certainly hate it too. And I am not talking about, there are many cases where somebody is an abuse victim and they are abusive. You know, they've been in an abusive relationship. That is very different than what I'm talking about. But when you, when your claim to fame is crisis, you're good in a crisis. I mean, this is literally what people would say about me. In order for me to feel good, I would have to go crisis shopping. And inevitably, I would attract people to me that were going to continue to reflect that my worth was based on my performance. And it's not sustainable. It also is very much speaks to this fear of living in an intimate relationship or really knowing people. We're not, we're just not sure if we're good enough without our production. We just don't believe we have value unless we contribute. 
And many alcoholics are treating that low self-esteem and that lack of knowledge that they are valuable because they exist mm -hmm. by alcoholism. And so the next step is to swing all the way to the other side and start overworking. You know, it Absolutely. Is you know, we talked about how to get out of this too before the break. And I want yes. to dive into that in this episode because this is a big thing. I found this hard to get out of. Yes. For me personally, and I still fall into the trap of this where my default will be to go work or to go do stuff. And, and I think that's fine if you enjoy mm -hmm. it to a certain degree. But everybody knows when they've kind of crossed the line. It's 1130 right. on a Tuesday. You don't really need to do this, but you're doing it anyway. Right. And I'm I'm all about, you know, look, I do a lot of accountability coaching, so I'm all about mm -hmm. paying full out. If you say you're going to do something, do it. But there is this line there. And I found that the way to get out of it for me was to actually, in my calendar, start to book some time for me. Yes. It made a huge difference. I mean, I know yes. you did that too. How did you go about, how did you go about doing that, Christina? Well, and I still do it on, on a daily basis. Of course, like I mentioned already, that personal care contract, but also realizing and visualizing and having goals in every area of my life. And one of those goals reflects that I have balanced time, that every day I do these things for myself, that I have quiet time. It's having that boundary, you know, in the can't say no program. If you if you don't know or are struggling with how to word a boundary, it's starting with that daily practice. These are very, very concrete things that you can do. If you have it on your goal list, if you're a list person, you need to write down downtime, just like you said in your scheduling, when you do your scheduling. You also want to let other people know that this is what you're doing. Those people around you that love you will applaud this. You know, they will applaud this. A lot of times we codependents have relationships set up on us giving, 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 and we attract those people that are happy taking, 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 you know. So when we start setting boundaries and we start actually taking care of ourselves, pay attention to the person who applauds it and the person who is frustrated with it. You know, you know, and I knew I knew that there was a problem is when I started booking out time for myself and I was very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. During that time, I felt like I was jumping out of my skin. That yes. was a good sign. That's you know, I had people on my left that said, "Hey, you know what? You need to make a commitment." And you know, my commitment in recovery this year is to have fun. Yes, I, you know, I'm a huge goal person, and in recovered life, Christina, I'm the one with the graphs and the charts. Yes, and the you strategy are. and what we're gonna do, right? <laughs> and I like it. And so, for me to come out to say, like, and I remember this in my men's group, they said, "Hey." you know, what's the goal? We went over goals for the year. And I said, one of my main goals is to actually have some fun, do some things that are fun for me, wow. right? At, do, go on some adventures, do some stuff. Yes. And I remember when I did this, I love riding horses and mm -hmm. I actually rented a horse for a period of yes. time and just rode the horse. Right. And I would leave in the middle of things that were really what I thought were very busy times where mm -hmm. I felt like I needed to be there. And I said, no, you know what? I've already worked the time that I could work. I'm now, it's time to have fun. And I would go and I would have fun. And, yes. you know, and it was, I remember that time when I broke through to that and I was like, wow, you know what? This is a whole new level of recovery. That might sound crazy. No, but it's true. The fact of just being able to be free and to be in the present moment. One of the things about being, having fun is that you're in the here and now. Yes. Work, not so much. Sometimes you're in no. the future, what's going to happen in the past, you know, what could I have done differently? Or you're trying to apply something, but in the, but having fun, you're in the here and now. Well, and you said something really, really important at the beginning of it. Uh, you said that it, when you felt uncomfortable, that is so important for people to recognize that that feeling Plus, it speaks to becoming right-sized, which is one of my favorite phrases and terms that helps my ego stay, you know, get in the back ego because we're right size right now, which means that everything that I think has to be done right now is is my ego lying to me saying you're too yeah. important. You're too you know magical. They have to have you. And I, I don't believe in, 
negative self-talk, but you know, it happens. Of course, we have a brain that has negative bias. We have a brain that goes there immediately as a way to be protective. And so what it looks like to me these days is, you know, I go, oh, there you go, Christy. You're thinking you're in charge of the world and you're not, yeah. you're not sweetheart. And I talk very nicely to myself and start with five minutes. Nobody needs to, you know, we're not looking for you. This is, you know, baby steps. We're not looking for you to plan out. I'm going to take Fridays off for the rest of my life. But I see, especially after the pandemic, that the, that we live in a world that's a little less focused on dopamine chasing and a little less focused on um, getting bigger and better, you know, uh, and really paying attention. And we're starting to actually realize that contentment actually has nothing to do with the old way of thinking as far as success. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things too, is I know people are listening to this and saying, damn it, Christine, you don't understand. I have to work 15 hours a day mm -hmm. just to survive. I work six to seven hours a week. I, I get it. We, we get mm -hmm. it. Christine and I understand, mm -hmm. but in that half an hour lunch that you have, you have to eat, you have to do whatever. Can you take a little bit to do something for yourself, right? And to check out of whatever the doingness of your of your work and just yes. be present in the and have fun maybe it's making yes. a call connecting with somebody doing something like that it's so so important you know one of the things that i've gotten with having fun is that you know one of the things is that being awake aware and alive i always say this all the time being mm -hmm. awake and aware and alive is one of the best things that happen when you're in sobriety getting so sober true. The ability, but being awake, aware, and alive is friggin' painful a lot of the times. So Sometimes, always yeah. never be able to turn off, never be able to. So in order to be able to relax and have some fun and to work at it, like for me, I got to tell you, honestly, having fun, Christina, still sometimes is work. I have mm -hmm. to work at it. Me too. I have to yes. plan it. I have to work at it. And I have to work at trying to be in the presence, present and breathe. It doesn't come naturally to me. It no, doesn't. And but I'm but I'm getting better at it as I do it more. Well, and so many of us, uh, I, I speak of ACOA all the time because I, I really believe it's like the, the doctorate degree of recovery that work. We learn that, uh, yes, we may be a workaholic, but that served us for a, for a time, you know, and not to to go ahead and, and speak negatively about it to yourself. It looks like integrating, which is slow and it's, you know, becoming flexible around it. And so whenever I get in that mode and I can feel it now because I've, I've have enough time under my belt, I have agency of thought because of the practices that I do every day, I can feel that that kind of ism bouncing inside of me about what do I have to do next to fill my time. And I just try to be really gentle with myself and say, oh, you're striving right now. And that isn't going to get you ultimately what you want. Yeah. Well, I always, you know, Christina, you know, one of the things that I've made a big change in my own life. And we mm -hmm. talk about this on the show. We talk about what's going on in our life because yes. when I, when I created recovered life, I was just like, you know what? I was sick of hearing the same things from the same playbook all the time. I was like, right. well, that's not what I'm going through. You know, mm -hmm. that's not where I was at 15 years or 25 years or that's not where I was. Right. Like, right. so the thing is, is like, I like to talk about what's actually really going on with me. Look, I've learned that I have a bit of an obsessive personality. A little I'm bit. That likes to lock in. I do, and you know what? I stop fighting that. Yes, I stop fighting that. And you know that I'll actually work for three days, mm -hmm. and you'll hear from me at like I'll send an email at three in the morning or whatever, because I work better in sprints. But I've learned on that fourth day, I'm not doing anything for a day and a half. I'm yes, sitting in or doing whatever. And I've learned that that works for me. And I could still get the balance that I need to be able to do it. I'm not a traditional nine to five person. I don't like it. It's yeah. never appealed to me. That's why I don't have a quote day job. Like, you know, it's just not my jam. It's like, it's the way that I do it. So I, but I've learned to work this in, right. That I don't do 24 hour. I don't do 15, 18 hour days, five days a week. Now I don't, I don't do that. Right. I'll have right. a sprint as I call it. I'll do it and then I'll let go and I'll plan to do something that's fun. And maybe the thing that I want to do is fun. Instead of doing it for two hours, I'll do it for four hours. Right. Right. So you have right. to make your own path of what's going to work for you. 
Yes. And that takes away that illusion that there's some specific formula out there. And I believe that as a, a world and certainly in the recovery community, we are starting to become awake, aware and alive on a much bigger scale where we can look at ourselves from a thousand feet above and say, wow, you know what? This didn't work. And I have to say the millennials taught me this. You know, I'm an 80s kid. I'm a Generation X. Go to school, go to college, buy a home. This is what you do. And they have started to teach me as well as Generation Z that, no, actually, individualism is kind of nice. And maybe we should design our life for some pleasure. And maybe it's OK that I don't want to work in a field that I don't love. You know, I, I know. And to each his own. That's the most important thing that you, I think, said was that you know what works for you. And so yeah. getting cognitive about what works for you is the most important thing. And discussing it with somebody, getting a plan, making act active choices to rest and you know remove yourself from obsession is going to help everybody. Absolutely. This has been such a great episode because I, this is something that people don't talk about. I don't even hear this in, in meetings, honestly, in no. 12 step meetings a lot, because I think people are afraid to be able to say, it's like, you know what? I don't really have balance. I right. don't, I've never learned balance in recovery. It's not appealing to me. It scares me. Mm -hmm. Having fun scares me, you know? And I think it's good that we talk about this, especially because we have time. Because yes. there's people that are younger that are looking to say, man, like, am I going to live my whole life sober and not having any fun? And I'm going to no. say, no, man, you, you don't, it doesn't have to be that way. And I think the fun is better sober. Honestly, I look back at the, what I thought was fun back in my drinking days. It's not even close to the fun that I have now. No, no, the cost is way too high. And it is really important to discuss this in long-term sobriety in all communities that we can course correct. If something's not working, we can change and develop our own relationship with a higher power and our own spiritual path. Well, Christina, this has been such a great episode. I want to remind people before we leave here that we have these discussions on Clubhouse and as part of our podcast called Recovered life discussions. You can get access to these because so many people want to actually talk back. We get yes. emails, we get Instagram things and people say, you know what? They, they, uh, they listen to the podcast and they say, you know what? I'd really like to be part of the discussion. Well, you can, all you have to do is go to recoveredlife.us, become a member for free. We're going to give you access to how many, does, how many live discussions are we having a week now? Five or six? We've got a lot. Yes. Of them. Yes, we do. We do. Four are regularly scheduled, 9 a.m. Pacific time, but there's also yeah. the replay. And they're just, it's a beautiful community of people uh, that you can come and jump up on the speaking stage and talk to us and share your ideas and what's going on with you. Because I guarantee you, somebody in that room, somebody in that discussion has either gone through it or is going through it. And that is how we stay in recovery. Absolutely, guys. So if you're not a member, become a member now, recoveredlife.us. Get access, join the discussions. You can listen, you can participate. We'll bring you up on stage and we talk about these important things like workaholism in recovery. So that's it. Wednesday, July 6, 2022, episode in the can. Everybody, we hope you go out and live your best recovered life. We'll see you next week. Bye. Keep the conversation going. Join Recovered Life, a community of like-minded people who are looking to live their best recovered lives. Membership is free, and you can apply at recoveredlife.us.